Quickly before I get into the video, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Unveil. Built by an amazing team who are very explicitly anti-AI and never NFT, Unveil is a super easy to use platform where you can create and share your OCs, being original content or original characters. Whether sketches, fully rendered art pieces or GIFs, Unveil supports pretty big file sizes for you to submit. And whilst it's predominantly art-based, this is a place for writers too. There's an infinite amount to be written for either your character or world. You can write plenty within dedicated lore sections, add traits which can be narrowed down to hobbies, likes, dislikes and far more to the world they belong to, as well as a whole art gallery dedicated to one character. It's a very community-based first and foremost. Say you've commissioned an artist for your character's visuals. Well, you can separately credit them just as easily as yourself. It's not a platform strictly dedicated to artists, but anyone who wants to involve themselves into the world of art too. If you want the opportunity to share your own OCs, or even view others' work with an ever-growing explore page, Unveil is a brilliant accessible site that again, actually feels more aligned with the values and views of artists. I'll put a link in the description if you wish to check the site out, and thank you again to the team at Unveil for sponsoring the video. There's been a few manga I've read that have included trans characters. From Glitch, Hunter Hunter, Boys Run the Riot, To Strip the Flesh, Heaven's Design Team, Fire Punch, Golden Kamui, Alice in Borderland, to Our Dreams at Dusk. And I have no doubt there are many more I've yet to read, stories that centre around the topic of trans identities, or stories that just so happen to include trans characters. But there's one manga in mind, whose trans character is so naturally pivotal to the story's themes of acceptance and love, that stands out to me. <laughs> I've talked about Skip and Loafer on the channel before, demonstrating its genuity in character writing through human connection. Takamatsu draws a story so appreciative of the mundane, while showing people from different walks of life, building relationships from the smallest of actions. And so, it's the loving dynamic between main character Mitsumi and her aunt now, a trans woman, that feels so heartfelt and candidly approached with nothing but warmth. It's a dynamic that resonates with me very personally, and through its exploration and furthering depth, came a specific moment so impactful to now as a character and me as a reader, that it quickly became my favourite manga scene. Now and Mitsumi's relationship is one of trust and acceptance established well before the main story, with Nao caring for younger Mitsumi as a babysitter. It makes Nao's presence feel continual in Mitsumi's life, and hence, the story. With a few exceptions, parental or guardian characters are petered in and out of slice of life stories, being there to give small guidance fleetingly. And yet, Nao's involvement in Mitsumi's life feels far more apparent and ingrained in the narrative. Whilst Nao may be absent for a few chapters, for the most part, she's constantly present in Skip and Lofa. She helps Mitsumi's lack of fashion sense, sees Mitsumi off on her first day of school, apologises when late from work for family dinner time, to secretly watching over Mitsumi's faux date, in case Shima leans into his school bad boy stereotype, of which that golden retriever never really does. But beyond those small actions, comes touching moments too. Nao is always listening to Mitsumi's rambles, or times of distress, becoming the positive adult figure in Mitsumi's new life in Tokyo. So much so that Mitsumi feels confident enough to ask Nao personal questions constantly, perhaps more than to her own parents. Even other characters in the cast, in particular Mika, are helped by Nao, whose experiences growing up trans fittingly come around in the ways of guidance she can empathise with especially when Mika's problems are comparably rooted in body image issues. But for Nao and Mitsumi, the shared level of trust is key to their relationship, and it's important to note it's the same when reversed. Whilst Nao is the adult in the relationship, Takamatsu assures the love is wholeheartedly reciprocated. And how couldn't it be, when Mitsumi is such a kind and selfless main character that her embracement of Nao feels so natural to her character type and personality. Mitsumi admits Nao has always been a caring figure in her life, 
and understands the genuity in Nao's love and care for her. In Bar Killua and Alaka's relationship in Hunter x Hunter, it's such a rarity to find a strong familial bond where the main character cherishes their trans sister, or in this case aunt, with such conviction. And whilst this is very much expected, or arguably bare minimum, the infrequency of trans characters treated in such a way makes their relationship one of a kind. Because the way Takamatsu presents the deep bond with such attentiveness makes scenes like Mitsumi standing up for her aunt against judgement and transphobic remarks reiterate that home isn't always a place, but a person. And to now, whilst the countryside may hold her roots, it's Mitsumi who will always hold a stronger connection to the word home. Nao's journey is one that many in the trans community can relate to. Growing up within a conservative countryside, Nao saves money by suffering through grim office jobs in order to escape the life that held her back. Tokyo offers expression, liberation and change. She is able to grow her hair out, wear whatever fashion she wishes and work a job she enjoys. I really like the nuance in how Takamatsu deals with Nao's perception of finding her own path even if it means having to leave family behind to let herself live. For most, it's only natural to stick with family or think about home. But for now, it comes with the reminder of bullying and isolation. And Takamatsu reiterates this in an interview, noting that the conflict between the countryside and city exists, and I believe there are people who don't fit in where they're born. And it's because I wanted to write a story about an adult who lives somewhere better suited for them who knows of the difficulties of life that I created Nao-chan. And you clearly see Nao flourish more in the city, but there's still moments of reminiscence, flickers of familial nostalgia that filter through Nao's mind. Those thoughts only become more prevalent when Mitsumi moves in, an embodiment of the countryside she left behind, and so the memories of home return like a distant dream. Except... Maybe it's from hearing a familiar dialect through Mitsumi's rambles, watching Mitsumi catch up with her countryside friends, or her own brother asking to revisit once in a while, does the thought of visiting the countryside not feel as painful as it once did? And yet despite this, Takamatsu flips this somewhat optimistic look into moving on from the past, with a sombre subject matter many older queer people experience, being rational envy. Because the significant difference between Mitsumi and Nao's perspective on Tokyo is that Mitsumi purposely travelled to progress into a specific educational path, whilst Nao travelled for a fresh start in a new location, having been in a forced position to choose her own well-being over others. Mitsumi can return home without fault, whilst Nao would struggle. And that's a common theme Takamatsu raises throughout the series, an adolescence of freedom and choice versus an adolescence of alienation and discrimination. Nao is constantly framed as the loving aunt who helps her niece no matter the issue, and she definitely does, that's not arguable, but from Nao's point of view, she's able to live a missed adolescence through Mitsumi. Seeing Mitsumi be challenged with the simplest of teenage girl endeavours is something Nao would have killed for at the same age. Her experience as an adult does allow her to help Mitsumi with issues regarding makeup and fashion, but there are often hints, mere minuscule facial expressions that give away the inner conundrum in these acts. Nao is jealous of Mitsumi, jealous seeing a life that she could have had too, to experience joy with friends and family, to have silly crushes and just be herself. They're by no means big asks nor wants, the events that happen to most kids are average experiences to have when young, and there's a constant internal battle in Nao's mind, the pain in witnessing what she missed out on versus the happiness she feels for her niece, which is why she never says anything, not wanting to bring her own grudges into Mitsumi's life. Takamatsu is able to draw that hidden expression so well, it's such a deeply rooted and specific type of jealousy that transness and in extension queerness can lend itself to. It's that want of basic human social needs, the want of acceptance that some don't even have to worry about. But for those alienated, specifically for their identity, it's an almost unfulfilled feeling, like you've lost out on so much. 
and now admits to these selfish views, because they're selfish in a way that doesn't hurt others, but only herself. She knows none of it is Mitsumi's fault, it could never be Mitsumi's fault, it's just happenstance of the world they live in and the time of which she was born. Still, even with those flickering moments of jealousy, does the love for Mitsumi completely outweigh the thoughts of doom and gloom? Omitsu, as now sweetly nicknames her, is the exact person now needed in her life. Mitsumi has such a beautiful heart, and that's exactly why so many in the cast fall in love with her in differing forms. For now, however, it's Mitsumi's natural way of bringing out the best in people that helped during her darkest moments. Because with all of these complexities of Nao's life explored, and the kindness of Mitsumi always shown throughout the narrative, it makes my favourite manga scene all the more impactful. A few volumes into Skip and Loafer, Takamatsu gives us a now focused chapter. It's almost a combination of everything I've touched on, a teenage now looking after a young Mitsumi, whose body language suggests a defeated nature whilst watching over a girl whose childhood won't be as repressed as her own. Child Mitsumi is as carefree as her older self, and now thinks about the innocence of childhood, untouched by the influence of the world and the prejudices people spread. And jealousy strikes again, hidden within the innocence of playfulness. It's not said maliciously, but an offhand comment that keeps a child happy, whilst voicing inner thoughts that'll face no repercussions. It's even phrased in good nature, it doesn't put Mitsumi down, but a want that regards the both of them in different ways. Mitsumi dashes off, not understanding the deeper meaning, as any child would, leaving now to ponder. Mitsumi and those younger will grow as society progresses, even if slowly, and whether she's LGBT or an ally, she will benefit from the improvements and acceptance of social and political movements fighting for human rights. But for now, for her childhood, it's too little too late. That harsh reality makes her wonder if anything or anyone will ever make her feel accepted for who she is at this time. Of which, naturally, innocent, baby cheeks Mitsumi steps in, giving now a flower bracelet that matches her crown. It's a gesture so kind, simple and innocent. I don't doubt the deeper meaning of the action flew over her head, but even when young, Mitsumi always knows the perfect way to make people feel seen. It's a slight surprise for now, a gift so small yet so grand in its measurement of love that it captivates her. It's the first time someone made now feel so validated. It's so sweet and exemplifies the true qualities of Skip and Loafer. It feels like a warm hug during a cold winter day, a little scene that feels so colourful in a story of black and white. And up to this point, we as readers know how much Nao and Mitsumi's dynamic continues to flourish, how Nao treats Mitsumi like she's the only one who matters, because I have no doubt this action meant the world to her, and potentially even saved her. Hey guys, thanks for watching to the end of the video. As always, I want to give a shout out to people on Patreon and on Ko-fi and also to Unveil for supporting this video. It truly means a lot and it really helps out with the channel. I also want to give a humongous shout out to each and every one of you guys because since the last video, I hit 100,000 subscribers and I also got my silver play button. And I don't really have the words to fully express how thankful I am for each and every single one of you for subscribing to the channel, for watching my videos, commenting on them, sharing them, pretty much anything that helps me out in any way, shape or form, because hitting 100,000K was something that younger me, because I watched YouTube, I've, I've been watching YouTube since I was like 11, 12, and I watch it pretty constantly, just as much as any streaming service. I probably watch YouTube more, actually, than streaming services. And Teenage Me always kind of dreamed of making my own channel and never even thought that the, the chance of getting 100,000 subscribers and getting a silver play button was possible. I still don't really know how, and I don't really know why, but for some reason, you guys continue to support me, and I genuinely appreciate that. 
so, so much. And I will be doing a Q&A video, probably after this one actually. So if you keep an eye on the community tab, I'll probably put a post on there saying, you know, give me any of your questions and I'll try and go through as many as I can in the video. So just keep an eye out for that. But other than that, I'll catch you guys in the next video.